Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to The Analyst by Vajay Ram and Ravi, where we would try to comprehensively analyze few articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express from the perspective of UPSC Civil Services Examination. The first article relates to the growing concern with respect to solar waste. This forms the part of Indian Express. The second article talks about the recently released report by World Inequality Lab, which talks about the income and wealth inequality in India. The third article talks about disease elimination as a possible strategy for complete disease eradication. This forms the part of the Hindu. The fourth article is about the importance of small scale LNG plants as India needs to fulfill its huge energy needs. This forms the part of the Indian Express. Finally, we'll talk about the quasi-judicial bodies NCLT and NCLT. This forms the part of the Indian Express. Now, the first article is related to the growing concern related to solar waste, right? So recently, a report published by CEW, that is Council on Energy, Environment and Water, in association with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, actually came to the conclusion that India actually produced 100 kilotons of solar waste in the year 2022-23, right? And this is projected to increase to reach about 600 kilotons by 2030, right? Now, this forms a very crucial uh, aspect of the solar energy generation in India, and it has to be handled effectively, right? Now, it forms a part of the conservation, environment pollution, degradation, and environment impact assessment, right? Now, coming to the very basic concept of solar energy. Now, what is solar energy? See, solar energy is the radiant energy emitted from the sun, right? So the radiant energy which is emitted from the sun is known as solar energy. Now primarily we can use this solar energy, we can exploit the solar energy into two potential ways. The first is photovoltaics and the second is the solar thermal energy. Now photovoltaics is nothing but the conversion of solar energy into electricity, right? And solar therm so thermal energy is a process where you are using the sunlight for heating purpose, for example, for cooking. For example, for heating buildings, right? So now let's talk about the photovoltaics. See, so photovoltaics is also known as solar power systems, right? Because they're actually converting the solar energy into electricity. Now, primarily they have four components, right? The first is the solar panels. Now, solar panels are actually, they contain numerous photovoltaic cells, which are actually made up of silicon or any other semiconducting material, right? Now, what happens is when the, elect when the sunlight strikes on these panels, these photovoltaic cell, which comprise of the silicon, right? Now, silicon, the electrons within this silicon atom, they actually are excited, right? They excite, it excites, the sunlight excites the electron of the silicon atoms, and it then leads to the production of electricity. Now, this is a very simple process, right? Now, once that, in electricity is generated, that is a direct current. We actually need to convert it into alternating current, AC. So for that, what we use is the inverter, right? Then finally, you have the balance of system. For example, you have this mounting grids, right? The wiring, all those things are known as the balance of system. So primarily, it comprises of four things, the solar panels, the PV cells, the inverter, and the balance of system, all right? Now, talking about the solar power in India, right? So as of December 2023, India had a total installed capacity of 73.31 gigawatts, right? Now, it actually is the fifth largest in the world. According to Invest India, it is the fifth largest in the world, the, to the total capacity, right? Now, if we talk about the prospects, right? So, see, India is a country which has abundant sun sunshine, right? So, according to a report, a data, it says that India receives annually around 3,000 hours of sunlight, right? This actually translates to a potential of 750 gigawatts, right? So this is huge. Now, if you use this solar energy, you can actually generate a lot of electricity. Now, then you have got ambitious target. See, India has adopted Panchamrit goals, right? One of the goals is to actually have 500 gigawatt of non-fossil electricity capacity. Now, out of this 500 gigawatt, the electricity generation from the solar power forms an important part, that is, forms a major part, that is around 300 gigawatts, right? Talking about the job creation, right? Now, the whole solar energy sector, 
it has huge opportunities when it comes to job creation. For example, in the manufacturing, then installation, right? Then you have got operations and maintenance, right? So it can provide huge job opportunities for millions of youngsters, right? Now, what are the challenges? See, India lacks domestic manufacturing. We are huge, like there is a huge dependence on imports. Imports are what? The solar modules and cells. The solar cells and modules. Right. There's a huge dependence, especially from China. Right. That is one of the biggest challenges. Talking about the second issue, that is land acquisition. Now, this is a very important issue. Right. Now, what happens is securing land for these projects becomes very cumbersome because we have got complex regulations by different states, right? Then there is a problem of competing land use. See, India is an primarily it's an ag agrarian economy, right? We have got the food security issue also. So if we'll use uh, like the, 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 the land area for the solar uh, energy installations, right? So it might compromise the food security aspect also, right? Then there is a third challenge, which is that of grid integration. See, the existing grids in India, they require significant technical upgrades right and that upgradation process is obviously very cost intensive right so that adds to the challenge now if we talk about the solar waste right now talking about the solar waste this is actually nothing but the waste generated into in we can streamline into two aspects the first is during the manufacturing that is during the manufacturing of cells in the modules and in the project life lifetime right so the waste generated in the manufacturing of the solar cells and modules and the waste generated during the project lifetimes that forms the the whole cumulative aspect of solar waste in india right now if you go by this study which which is as i just sold which is which, which was conducted by the council on energy environment and water in association with the ministry of new and renewable energy now it says that now cew it must be kept in mind that it is a climate think tank it's a climate think tank right so first of all it talks about the solar capacity so it says that now already told you the data right about like in uh, in this slide we had this that india had a total capacity of 73.31 gigawatt in december uh, 2023 now it talks about uh, the data from the march 2023 and says that the solar capacity in india was at that time 66.7 gigawatts right now it says that that the capacity, the solar capacity has actually increased 23 times in the last 10 years. Now, this is huge. Solar capacity in India, the installed capacity has increased 23 times in the last 10 years, right? And it is expected that it might reach to 292 gigawatts by 2030, right? So, therefore, the importance, this issue of solar waste becomes of crucial importance, right? We need to have those strategies so that we can minimize the solar waste or we can manage the solar waste effectively. Now, this study says that like in the financial year 2022-23, India generated a cumulative solar waste of 100 kilotons. 100 kilotons, right? And it is expected that this waste would actually reach to 600 kilotons. Now, Understand that this is cumulative, right? By 2030. And by 2050, it might reach 19,000 kilotons. Right? So we need to have a good strategy, a robust strategy, so that we can minimize, we can effectively utilize this solar waste, right? Now, one thing needs to be kept in mind, that in this 19,000 kilotons of the cumulative waste, which is expected to be generated, 77% would form the part of the solar waste which would generate from the new capacities right new capacities right so if you just look at this graph you can see that the solar waste would increase about 32 times between 2030 and 2050 right now just look at this graph it says that this is from the existing capacity this waste right and this increase you can see the mammoth increase right this forms the increase from the new capacity Right. So what we need to have is sort of those strategies, which actually also focus, focus upon the prospective plants, 
right? Those plans which are not in existence, right? We need to have a prospective strategy. Now, India's current installed solar capacity, right? It would generate a total waste of 340 kilotons by 2030. So the current capacity, now the earlier data, which we just talked about 600 kiloton, it actually also includes the new capacities. But if we just consider the existing capacity, right? So it would generate 340 kilotons of solar waste, right? Now, five states, five states, that is Rajasthan, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh. Now, these five states cumulatively account for 67% of this waste, right? They would account for 67%. Now, the reason is simple that as of now, these are the states which produce the highest solar energy in India, right? So, obviously, they'll have to bear the burden of solar waste also, right? Now, these solar waste, this discarded modules, they contain critical minerals, right? Now, for example, we have got silicon. For example, we have got copper. For example, we have got tellurium. For example, we have got cadmium. Now, these form a part of the critical minerals that is, which are important for the national security of the country, right? So, the study says that this discarded modules, they would actually have around 10 kilotons of silicon, silver about 12 to 14 tons, right? And it would have around 16 tons of cadmium and Tellurium. Now, if we can effectively use this waste, right, if we can recycle it, we will have enough of these critical minerals with us, right. So, if you can just look at this graph, you see that Rajasthan and Gujarat will lead the solar waste. Now, by 2030, Rajasthan would actually generate around 14 kilotons of this waste. Gujarat also around 12, 12 uh, kilotons, right. So, these five states would account around 70% of the total waste generated, right? Now, this study also talks about how to deal with solar waste, right? It has given few recommendations, right, for managing the solar waste. The first is to maintain a comprehensive database of the installed solar capacity. Now, why this is important? See, if you have this comprehensive database, you can actually estimate the solar waste in the following years, right? That would give you a good estimation of what the solar, how much the solar uh, waste would actually get accumulated, right? There's a second is that you need to actually incentivize the recyclers and the concerned stakeholders. What we mean by this is that we need to give them adequate financial and technical support, right? To the recyclers and the concerned stakeholders, right? Then we need to actually create a market for solar recycling. We already saw that these discarded materials, the modules and the cells, they have critical minerals in them. So we need to actually develop a market, right? How we can do, do that? We can actually, through sustainable recycling of these modules, right? If you sustainably recycle these modules, you, we can actually use, we can actually create a market and use these critical minerals, right? Then basically there are two ways of recycling. The report talks about two ways, right? The first way is the conventional recycling that is also known as the bulk recycling, right? What it actually means is it comprises of the mechanical processes. For example, you have the shearing process. For example, you have the crushing process, right? Now in this process, we cannot actually recover, we cannot recover valuable minerals, right? We cannot recover. It is cost efficient, but we cannot recover the, the critical uh, minerals present, right? In the second process, we have the high value recycling, right? Now, this actually comprises of not just the mechanical, but also mechanical plus thermal plus chemical processes, right? This is cost intensive, but you are, we are able to actually recover these critical minerals from this, right? Now, thus what is needed is that we need to have 
these strategies, we need to have robust strategies so that we can effectively manage this menace of solar waste, right? Because India is expanding its solar energy with rapid pace, right? So we need to have all these strategies in place so that this problem can be resolved. So coming to the second article, that is income and wealth inequality. So recently a report was published by the World Inequality Lab, right? That is the income and wealth inequality in India. And it and it talked about and said that 1% of the Indians income, now what they have, their share is actually higher than what it was in the British rule, right? So the inequality in India is increased manifold and that is what the report focuses upon, right? Now it forms a part of GS3, inclusive growth, and also you can use this. Now this article is very much sort of data intensive, right? We'll talk about a lot of data that can be used effectively in the essay as well, right? Now, talking about the income and wealth inequality, right? Now, these two words, income and wealth inequality, we are we mostly use them interchangeably, right? But that is not the case, right? They actually differ. How? See, income inequality is actually the disparity in how income, now that income actually could mean salary, wages, right, salary or wages, the disparity in how that income is distributed across population. That is what we call as the income inequality, right. Now, this is generally measured with a, with a metric which is known as the Gini coefficient, right. Now, it actually says zero is for the perfect equality and one represents the perfect inequality, right. All right. Now, talking about wealth inequality. See, wealth inequality is the uneven distribution of assets. What do we mean by assets? See, assets can mean cash, savings, real estate, right, or bonds. That is all the valuable positions we have. That is the wealth. So if you have a disparity in the distribution of these assets among these different sections of the people, the different segments of the population, we call it wealth inequality, right? Now, let's first talk about what are the causes of these income and wealth inequality. The first is the unequal access to education and skills, right? According to the World Bank, right? This unequal access to the education and, and skill according to the World Bank, it creates disparity in employability and earning potential, right? If we have the unequal access to education and skill, it would create disparity in employability and the earning potential. Coming to the second, labor market rigidities. See, according to the ILO, according to the ILO, International Labour Organization, this labour market rigidities, what we mean is the complex regulations or limited job mobility. That is, if you are facing hurdles in moving from one occupation to the other, that is limited job mobility, right? So these actually result, it prevents certain groups to earn more income, right? It prevents them and their wages almost remain constant, right? Then we have got the gender pay gap. Now, according to the World Economic Forum, right, they have a report which is known as the gender uh, pay gap, right? So it says that persistent gender pay gaps, it actually contributes to income inequality. It's obvious that if women would earn lesser than men for the same work, so they would, it would lead to income inequality, right? So according to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Pay Gap Report of 2023, now the gender pay gap in India is 28%, stands at around 28%, right? Talking about the informal sector dominance. See, informal sector is something which is, according to the ILO itself, it constitutes 80% of India's workforce, right? Of India's workforce. Now, this actually is characterized by low wages, right? Limited social security, right? So, it also creates, leads to income and wealth inequality. Now, talking about caste system and social inclusions, now, according to the Oxfam, Oxfam India, this legacy 
of caste and social exclusion now that has actually led to it has restricted opportunities especially for the marginalized sections right it restricts opportunities for the marginalized sections talking about the inheritance and wealth accumulation now these two points the inheritance and wealth accumulation and the asset price inflation they are actually in context of wealth inequality how see if you have inherited if someone has inherited wealth so that would actually perpetuate the advantages and those who don't have the inherited inherited wealth they would face the disadvantages talking about the asset price inflation now what it means is see according to the rbi according to the rbi the rising prices of this assets of different assets for example the real estate right they actually benefit those who already have these assets right if someone has a real estate and the prices are constantly increasing that is actually leading to wealth accretion right so it would ultimately lead, lead to wealth inequality in the society right now talking about the report itself now these are the highlights right now it says that the the report says that in 2000 in 2022 22.6% of the national income it went to just top 1% of the indians right and in 1951 this share was actually 11.5% right in 1951 the inequality was less right but now the inequality has increased right and in the 1980s it was when india just opened the economy that is the pre liberalization era over there at that time it was 6% right the top uh, 1% of the indians actually had 6% share right now that then it talks about the share of the top 10% indians now it has increased that is from 36.7% in 1951 to 57.7% in 2022 right then it talks about the bottom 50% of the indians right it says that indians earned only 15% of the national income in 2022 compared to 20.6% in 1951 right so they have actually the share their share has actually reduced now talking about the middle 40% it says that they it has also recorded a sharp fall in their share of income from 42.8% to 27.3% in the same period that is from 1951 till 2022 the gap between the rich and the poor has widened rapidly in the last two decades right now it also says that in 2022 now this is a very important point the share of the national income that went to the top the wealthiest 1% of the income now it recorded a historic peak right and it is even higher than the developed countries of the world such as the united states and the united kingdom okay now if we talk about the details of the report right the data points given in the report it says that the chart one if you look at the chart one the chart one shows the income group wise distribution right it says that around 1 crore adults that were in the top 1% right just look at this the top 1% around 1 crore people now they share 22.6% in the total national income right and 10 crore in the top 10% the top 10% of these people they have a share of 57.7% right and the middle 40% that is this it shares 27.3% coming to the bottom 50 they share only 15% of the total income right now notably the 10000 richest indians that is the top 0.001% now it has a share of 2.1% of the national income can you imagine right so that is the stark inequality which we have right now if we talk about the income disparity right now that has ex existed since ages right but that gap has actually deepened at a reckless pace right if you just look at this graph the chart second it shows the distribution of the 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 year wise share of national income for the top 10% bottom 50% and the middle 40% can you just see that this blue line it actually talks about the top 10% this difference this gap has been continuously increasing right and this post liberalization that is in 1990s when we thought that you know liberalization would actually lead to more job opportunities less income inequalities the opposite has actually happened right you can just look at the graph itself so the income of the top 10% has increased and that of these categories the middle 40% and the bottom 50% that has decreased 
Now, if we look at chart three, which shows the year wise richest 1% Indians share in the income, right? So in the 1930, it, it actually touched the 20% mark over here, right? That was the highest before independence, right? But after independence, the share of the top 1% steadily de declined, right? So it is on a declining mode, right? And that it came, came to 6% in the 1980s. Remember, pre-liberalization, right? And however, post-liberalization after these reforms of 1990s, right? Their income share has surged again and is presently hovering around 22.5 mark, right? Again, it has gone to that of pre-independence times, right? So which is much even higher than the share under the British rule. So at that time, it was 20%. Now it is even higher, that is 22.5%. Now, if we talk about the next chart, chart four, it shows the income shares of India's top 10% and top 1% compared with select countries, right? So India's top 1% were even above the income shares in 2022-23. Their income share was even above the levels recorded in the United States, China, France, UK, and Brazil, right? So look at this graph, right? So the top 1%, in, in the US, they have 20.9% share, while in India, we have got 22.6%. You just compare it with UK, they have 10.2%. In India, we have got 22.6%. That is a cause of concern, right? Now, the next chart, it talks about the chart shows the year-wise average incomes in China and Vietnam as a sh percentage share of India's average income. Now, China's and Vietnam average income, they have grown at a much faster pace than India's trajectory. What it means is that the growth in China and India, in China, sorry, in China and Vietnam has been more inclusive as compared to India, right? So Indian growth is actually resulting into huge income and wealth inequalities, right? Now, let's talk about the impact of inequality. What are the impacts of this, this inequality? The first is the social mobility. What we mean by, is, by this is that if you have got a lot of income and wealth inequality, it would actually, it would be very difficult for the disadvantaged sections to improve their economic standing, right? because they won't have the capacity to do so, right? So it would be very difficult for the disadvantaged sec sections, especially to improve their economic standing. Co coming to the second point, that is social unrest. Now, as the income and wealth inequalities in the society would increase, it would lead to more social unrest and political instability. For example, we have got the you know youngsters they are demanding reservations right why because there is a growth there's a very deepened gap when it comes to the income levels of different sections of the society right then it can lead to economic stagnation what we mean by is that it can actually hinder the overall economic growth why because if the major part of the society if that is poor or if that doesn't have the adequate resources, so it would obviously hinder the overall economic growth of the country, right? Now, talking about how to ad actually address this inequality. The first is we need to have adequate investment in education and skill development. Why? See, if we invest properly in education and, and skill development, it can improve the overall employability and earning potential. If you give the people, the youngsters especially, the adequate capacity, right, the educational capacity, so they would find more economic opportunities, right, and they can actually earn their livelihoods, and that would, with time, lead to lessening of these inequalities. Second is labor market reforms. What we mean by is that we need to actually close or end these rigidities in the labor market, right? How we can do so? We can do so by promoting job mobility, right? It should be easier for people to switch from one job to the other, right? That would obviously come when you would have adequate skills with the people. Then you, we should actually strengthen the labor rights. We need to focus upon the gender pay gap, right? So these steps must be taken. Then we have got the social security net. 
what what we mean by is is that it should we need to provide cushion to the vulnerable section through for example insurance schemes right so that during times of distress so they can have a cushion right then next is the taxation policies see in india we already follow the concept of progressive taxation right so that has to be strengthened right we need to focus more upon the progressive taxation so that there can be a redistribution of wealth right and it can narrow the gap thus we need to have a sort of an over encompassing strategies different different strategies so that ultimately this gap this widening gap of the income and wealth inequality can be reduced right and we can have a more inclusive society now the third article talks about the strategy of disease elimination as a possible way forward for complete disease eradication right now see the context is that we have we have to end the different ap epidemics for example that of malaria tuberculosis then the ntds that is neglected tropical disease by 2030 and this has been one of the sustainable development goals which was adopted by the united nations now this forms the part of public health so let's start now let's go from the basics see there is a sort of burden of disease especially when it uh, comes to the uh, context of developing and the least developed countries right now there's a metric right how to measure this burden of disease we call it disability adjusted like adjusted life years now this can be important for your prelims as well right it forms now it is actually it comprises of two components right the first is the that of the years of life lost that is yrl now this means that the number of potential life years which are lost because of premature mortality right so if someone is like had premature mortality so the potential number of years which he would have survived for which he would have survived that is the years of life lost right the second component is about the years lived with disability that is ylds so that is the number of years a healthy life is lost because of any disease any particular disease right that is or a disability that is years of life with disability and years of life lost right so the disability adjusted life years it actually comprises of yll that is years of life lost and second is the years lived with disability ylds right so according to the world health organization according to the world health organization in 2019 the communicable maternal neonatal and nutritional diseases right they actually accounted for an average of 52% of the dailies theek hai in developing countries compared to that of 21% in developed countries it means that developing countries and the least developed countries are more prone to these these infectious diseases for example hiv then you have got tuberculosis then we have got malaria or diarrheal disease or respiratory disease right those infectious disease come in, into the category of communicable maternal neonatal and nu nutritional disease right talking about the ncds that is non communicable diseases so in 2019 same according to the who so ncds accounted for about 48% of dailies in the developing countries compared to 79% in the developed countries it says that the burden of non communicable disease is more in the developed countries but this highlights the ongoing burden of this communicable maternal neonatal and nutritional disease and it also highlights the increasing trend of ncds for example stroke heart disease right or chronic respiratory diseases right so these forms a part of the non communicable disease now let's also talk about the article also mentions about the ntds that is the uh, the neglected tropical disease now what does it mean see the ntds are a diverse group of chronic infectious infectious diseases so if you define it 
these are nothing but diverse group of chronic infectious diseases right and they have they cause significant illness they cause significant illness and disability however they receive less attention right they receive less attention less attention and funding that's the reason we call it neglected right though they cause significant sufferings but they actually receive less global attention and funding right now entities cumulatively affect around 1 billion people around the world right now if you talk about the examples we can have the first is leishmaniasis now it is nothing but a parasitic disease right then we can have leprosy it is a bacteria bacterial disease infection then we can have dengue right dengue fever so this is a mosquito borne viral disease so these are they, they all come into the category of the over encompassing overall encompassing the neglected tropical diseases right see now let's talk about this concept of disease elimination as a possible strategy as a first step in disease eradication so what do we actually mean by and how do we differentiate between disease elimination and disease eradication see disease elimination is it actually means achieving zero transmission in a particular region so that is what if you achieve zero transmission of that disease in a particular re uh, region then you call it disease elimination when it comes to eradication that is the permanent eradication is the permanent cessation of infection right with no risk of reintroduction that is what eradication means right now for developing countries we need to first focus upon disease elimination that is what is important now this is a highly desirable objective for the developing and the least developed countries right especially for those those poor people who are most vulnerable to de these infectious diseases right now this elimination strategy it is challenging definitely and it is resource intensive and what it needs actually is that we need to have robust phcs now what do we mean by this see the primary healthcare has to be robust what it means that is we detect and deal with that disease at the grassroot itself right we don't wait for the disease to spread then what we need to focus upon the diagnostics to have the early detection right then we need to focus on the surveillance capacity what do we mean by this is that it should be capable of capturing every incidence of disease right it should be capable of uh, capturing the every disease which has occurred in a particular region now then we talk about the international sorry the increased deployment of health professionals that is doctors nursing staff right lab tech lab technicians so adequate human resource has to be provided right coming to the third aspect that is international support right international support in terms of funding right there has to be options available so that for example the who or any other multilateral organization should provide the adequate resources especially in context of least developed countries then we we should also focus upon the expertise when it comes to project management right then it should we should also focus upon uh the technical aspects technical guidance right final then we have got the importance of political and bureaucratic commitment now why this is important is that especially in in countries like india we need to have robust implementation right if there is no robust implementation the whole process would suffer right so for that what we need is a sort of a commitment from both the political uh, aspect and from the bureaucratic aspect right then we need to have multi sectoral co co uh, collaboration what we mean by is that which actually focuses upon innovation right which actually focuses upon adopting effective solutions 
people need to participate they need to deliberate and then they reach, they need to reach to a particular strategy of what the best possible strategy should be then we need to have ultimately the most important part is public participation right if we don't have an effective public participation in terms of public awareness about let's say wash water sanitation and hygiene right so public needs to be made aware and they need to actually accept and follow these practices right so ultimately we can uh, we can lead to a path we can actually achieve that result of disease elimination and ultimately that of disease eradication which india has actually done when it comes to for example the disease of yours or polio right or guinea worm disease so india has actually eradicated uh, many disease so what it needs to focus upon is a new strategy of disease elimination so that we can have more eradication of different of other infectious disease now let's talk about the small scale liquefied natural gas plants right now these have been set up the first has been set up in india and it was set up in vijayanagar vijaypur complex in madhya pradesh now we'll talk about why this is important when it comes to the energy security of india and what actually is small scale lng right so it forms a part of resource mobilization and science and technology so let's start now let's start from the basics what is natural gas right see natural gas is a fossil fuel right which is a naturally occurring mixture of gaseous hydrocarbons that is what is natural gas primarily the content by volume that is it is methane that is ch4 around 95% by volume is that of ch4 right other hydrocarbons are also there for example you have ethane propane butane but in a very small quantity now what has been the process see plants and animals they have decayed for millions of years and they have decomposed in an oxygen depleted environment so that has actually resulted in in the formation of methane and other hydrocarbon gases right that is what the natural gas is all about now what are the benefits of natural gas see the first is cleaner burning so if you compare it with other fossil fuel for example coal it has it is much it has a burning which is much cleaner right then it releases lower amount of pollutants like for example we have got ni nitrogen oxides or sulfur oxides right or we have got particulate matters right so it releases less pollutants right then it is cheaper than oil see especially when it comes to india right which has which is to mostly dependent on its on the imports of oil right so 85% of india's oil requirement is fulfilled through imports right so if we have an alternative which is cheaper than oil obviously it will lead to foreign exchange savings right then reduce health risk as we just discussed see if it would emit less harmful gases that is sulfur oxides nitro nitrogen oxides right or particular matter it would be associated with fewer respiratory health problems right as compared to other fossil fuel for example coal right then transportation and storage see it is relatively easy it is relatively easy easy to transport and have the storage infrastructure for the natural gas when it come when it, when if you compare it with coal see coal is something which is bulky and this natural gas is lighter than air right so obviously you can have a more relatively easy approach of transportation and storage if you compare it for example coal then fuel efficiency see natural gas is more efficient than coal fired plants right the plants the power plants which use natural gas as a source material right they are more efficient than the coal based power plants right and because they convert higher percentage of fuel into electricity right 
Now let's talk about small scale LNGs, that is liquefied natural gas. But before that, see, we already saw that natural gas has got many benefits if we compare it with the other conventional fossil fuel, for example, coal, right? That is the reason that government of India has been striving to enhance the share, to increase the share of the natural gas in the primary energy mix by, to 15% by 2030, which at present is around 6%, right? Now, the major challenge in doing so is the is a challenge related to the transportation of gas, right? Because there are many places in the country which are not connected to the natural gas pipeline, right? So that becomes a, a sort of a hindrance in the path of expanding this network of natural gas, right? Also, it hinders the use of LNG as a fuel for long haul trucks and intercity buses, right? Right. If you don't have these facilities around the country, obviously we won't be able to capitalize or use this for the long haul trucks, right? Or the intercity buses. Now, see the large scale, the large scale projects involving the natural gas, they have got long gestation period, right? Maybe decades, right? That is the reason it is not a sort of a very preferred model of expanding, right? Now, the last mile delivery challenge also exists because it persists in many parts of the country. Why? Because uh, see, as I just told, the natural gas distribution is not uniform. It exists, is not uniform around the country, right? So that is the reason we need to is not uniform around the country. So that is the reason we need to develop those solutions which enhance the use of, which enhance the use of natural gas for fulfilling India's energy needs. So that is the reason we, we need to have new age solutions which, which have fast turnaround times, those projects which can be implemented quickly and we can get the result quickly. That is what we mean by the fast turnaround times. So the need of the hour is to expand the reach, access and consumption of the natural gas. How we can do it so, that is what we'll talk about one of the promising solution is that of the small scale LNGs, right? So it's a promising solution, which is the small scale liquefied natural gas, right? Now it is a nascent industry. It has just evolved and it lacks definition. What primarily it means is that it refers to the liquefaction of the natural gas and its transportation using unconventional means that is with significantly small scale operations than the conventional method of transporting the natural gas through long pipelines, right? So we don't use that. What we use is unconventional transportation methods, right? So simply put, the LNG is in the liquefied, in the liquid, first liquefied, that is converted into super chilled form and then supplied into specialized trucks in, and small vessels, right? To the industrial or commercial users, right? To that, to those reasons which are actually not covered by the pipeline network and then so that we can effectively utilize the natural gas energy source even at those places where the distribution network doesn't exist right that is how we use the small scale lng projects now the use case can be of two types how see that lng that liquefied lng which has been transported to a particular station that can be used for CNG for vehicles or it can be used for household or manufacturing units. So that has to be actually converted to CNG. LNG has to be converted into CNG. For that we use small vaporizers, right? Those buyers can have small vaporizers and then supply it to the end users. But if the use is related to the direct use in its liquid form, it can be supplied to the end users directly without converting it into uh, the compressed natural gas, right? That is how we actually use the LNG into two ways. Now, this chain of small scale LNG can actually start from the large scale LNG import terminal. For example, as you have that in Kochi, right? You can directly start from there through the use of cryogenic road tankers. What we mean is that they're super cooled refrigeration systems, right? So through the use of these cryogenic road tankers or small vessels, we can directly use them at the terminal itself and transport to different places. The second way can be to use these small scale LNG at the locations where you have got natural gas supply or where small liquefaction plants are located. For example, in the current case of Vijaypur, right? Vijaypur is the Gales, that is Gas Authority of India's limited largest gas processing facility. That is the example of the later kind of location. Now, 
we also have an organization which is Petronet. Now, this is jointly promoted by the Gas Authority of India Limited, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, Indian Oil Corporation, Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited, right? It has been pushing for the greater adoption of LNG as an automotive fuel, as a marine fuel, as in regulation of cases, for example, the CGD network, the city gas distribution networks, or in industry, so that we can capitalize upon the use of natural gas as we have talked as it has a lot of advantages over the conventional coal all right now how to use the lng in long haul trucks and buses is it a feasible option right so we'll talk about it see compared to diesel lng is significantly cleaner we already talked about it right it reduce it has reduced carbon dioxide emissions and negligible particulate matter when compared to that of diesel right same case goes with the sulfur dioxide emission or the nitrogen uh, emissions right lng also offers longer range to vehicles than diesel for the same fuel sized tanks right for the same tanks of same volume the natural gas can give you a higher distance it can travel a higher distance than you come then compared with if you compare it with the diesel right and it is also cheaper than the crude oil right from which the diesel is derived then it can also replace a major chunk of india's diesel consumption if we can do that by lng so it would lead to substantial savings on the foreign exchange part we already told that we already discussed that 85 percent of the country's oil needs are actually imported right and that as has a huge burden on the foreign exchange reserves right and LNG is comparative, natural gas is comparative cheaper than the oil. So we need to focus upon that. Then LNG has been used successfully in many countries. Primarily the example is China in the medium and heavy commercial vehicles, right? So if China can do that, obviously India can also do that. Now the challenge is related to the deployment of LNG as a suitable fuel for the long haul transport is that we have got lack of easy availability of LNG powered vehicles, right? And the initial cost of these system of vehicles is very high, right? Moreover, there's absence of LNG ve vehicle financing ecosystem, right? And there is virtually non-existence of the LNG retail network, right? Which is which is uh, the reason why we are focusing upon the small scale LNG, right? For example, we have got companies such as Gale and Petronet. Now they are working to build a viable ecosystem for transporters, right? So that they can move from the diesel vehicles to that of the LNG. They're actually working upon providing the retail outlets for this LNG at the major highways of India, right? Thus, small scale LNG is definitely a promising option and more research and uh, has to be done on it so that we can deploy it at different locations and reap the advantages, right? So that the problem of energy, the energy crisis can be resolved and we can you we can have more better options, more cleaner options, more cheaper options than the, the ones we are actually using now, right? So let's talk about the last article of the day. That is a discussion about, about the NCLT and NCLT. This is National Company Law Tribunal and National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. So recently, NCLT directed banks not to take action against the ILNFS directors. Now this is a part of GS2 slabus that is quasi judicial bodies and it is also important for the prelims now nclt and nclt they are both both quasi judicial bodies what we mean by quasi judicial bodies that they have some characteristics of courts and also of administrative bodies so those bodies which have characteristics of courts and that also of administrative bodies, those bodies are termed as quasi-judicial bodies. Now, they were established, both were established under the provisions of the Companies Act 2013 first. They regulate and adjudicate the matters which are related to the Indian companies. Now, if we specifically talk about the NCLT, that is National Company Law Tribunal, so it serves as a primary body for adjudicating company law matters in India. It has original jurisdiction. That is, it hears the case for the first time itself, right? Anyone can directly approach the NCLT, right? That is what we mean by original jurisdiction. Now, NCLT bench is actually chaired by a judicial member who is supposed to be retired or serving high court judge and a technical member who must be from the ICLS cadre that is Indian Corporate Law Service right and it has 16 benches right around the country 
Now it handles a broad range of matters, right? It includes, for example, the company incorporation and registration, increase or decrease in the share capital, mergers and acquisitions, right? Company restructuring, operations and uh, operation and mismanagement by the directors. It also looks into the insolvency and bankruptcy proceeding under the insolvency and the bankruptcy code of 2016. It also looks into the cases of winding up of companies, right? Now, if we talk about the NCLT, so it is an appellate tribunal for the matters which are decided by the National Company Law Tribunal, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, the Competition Commission of India, and you have got the National Financial Reporting Authorities. For all these four bodies, it serves as the appellate tribunal. Now, the NCLT includes a chairperson. So, at present, we have got the former uh, justice, former judge of Supreme Court, that is uh, Ashok Bhushan. So, he is the chairperson. Then we have got three judicial members and two technical members. They are also from retired from the High Court and two technical members also, they can be eminent CS, company secretary or CA or from the Indian Corporate Law Service, right? So it, in total, it consists of not more than 11 members, the, the appellate tribunal, right? So the decisions of the NCLAT are appellable in the Supreme Court of India. NCLAT has principal bench at Delhi and one other at the Chennai. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you.